all the district and Department of Energy does. The purpose of this is to show you how to use your imagination. A foundation in science, technology, engineering, and math. Developing these technologies for science. Climate change. We're talking about energy. Big dreams. Clean energy is the way of the way future. This is Direct Current. Welcome back to another episode of Direct Current, an energy.gov podcast. I'm Allison Lantero. And I'm Matt Dozier. So, Allison, how do you feel about tech support? I get a headache just thinking about it. Yeah, it can be pretty awful. Well, this week we've got a story about tech support on a global scale. Except instead of computers, they fix clean energy policy. And this help desk is actually helpful. That sounds a lot better than my experience. We also have an interview with a professor who teaches about climate change while cycling 600 miles across the state of Montana. And later in the show, Dan Wood tries to explain how we measure energy with, believe it or not, burritos. Stick around. Hi, this is Sean Esterly with the Clean Energy Solution Center. Uh, yeah, hi, Sean. I'm an energy minister, and the government I work for really wants more renewable energy, uh, and we just don't know where to start. Can you help me? Yeah, glad you gave me a call. That's exactly uh, one thing that the Solution Center does. So in a sense, it's kind of like tech support, but specifically for clean energy policy. We actually have an Ask an Expert service, and through that, we can provide technical assistance to you and to your government to help you with those clean energy policies that you're struggling with. That's great. That, that sounds exactly like what I need. How, how does that work? Yeah, so you can either submit a request by... Matt here. Okay, so obviously I'm not really an energy minister, but the Clean Energy Solution Center is real. And the service it provides has helped more than 90 countries around the world lay the groundwork for sustainable energy. We'll get into the details of how it works later, and we'll hear from someone who has seen exactly the kind of difference expert assistance from the Solution Center can make firsthand. But before we get to that, there's one more really great thing about the service. So the best part is it's going to be completely free to you. Really? Yeah, no cost at all. All right. Sounds great. I would love to talk to one of your experts and get this started. All right. Great. I'll connect to you. Thanks very much. No problem. Happy to help. It was 2008, and the energy situation in West Africa was looking pretty bleak. With the price of crude oil skyrocketing, a group of 15 nations known as the Economic Community of West African States, or ECOWAS, which includes Nigeria, Ghana, and Senegal, found themselves being slowly strangled by rising energy prices. So together, they established a new agency, which goes by the acronym ECRI, to explore another option, dramatically expanding the region's focus on renewable energy and energy efficiency. Now, there are a lot of reasons why renewable energy is so appealing to nations with limited resources. On one hand, you have the issue of basic access to energy. In many West African countries, electricity is a luxury enjoyed by fewer than one in five people. If you have been to this part of Africa, then you understand what electricity and what clean cooking fuels really mean to the people. You get to a village where after six o'clock, the whole place is just dark. Life comes to a standstill. You cannot get out of the house. When you see that, then you realize that these people are really going through hell. That's Mahama Kapia, the executive director of ECRI. And he knows all too well how crippling a lack of electricity can be to a community's quality of life. Every production activity in these communities is manual. Healthcare delivery becomes an issue. You have education. The children can only learn up to the evening, and then their study time is cut short because there's no light. And then you realize the importance of having electricity. You go to the community that they have it, you see that the lifestyle is completely different. The people are living a more cheerful life. Even their appearance will tell that, oh, these people are living a lot better than those on the other side without any light. 
So with high energy prices putting the squeeze on the region, the leaders of the 15 ECOWAS countries got together and decided that they wanted more renewables. Each country developed its own action plan, but Mahama said the initial results were mixed at best. We have national consultants, but they are not very experienced and they are not very technically sound. They need some support. We needed some expert group to give it some quality control in doing this work. And this, this is the point where the Clean Energy Solutions Center can make a huge impact. Mahama reached out to the Ask an Expert service, which put him in touch with Toby Couture. I'm Toby Couture, founder and director of E3 Analytics based in Berlin. Toby speaks three languages, is working on a fourth, and has more than a decade of experience in clean energy policy and finance. He even used to work at the Department of Energy's National Renewable Energy Lab, or NREL, which serves as the home base for the Solution Center. So, all in all, a good person to go to for help on tough policy questions. He's one of the more than 50 experts who make up the Solution Center's crack team of international specialists, dispensing fast, no-cost clean energy advice around the world at a moment's notice, and helping expand access to electricity. The need for electrification is so huge and growing that any effort to support access to electricity, access to affordable electricity, I think is going to pay dividends for decades to come. And while having electricity does play a big part in someone's quality of life, Toby pointed out that it's also an essential ingredient for a thriving economy. Without reliable access to affordable electricity, it's very difficult to have sustained economic development. It's routinely cited as one of the biggest, if not the biggest challenge that businesses in Africa face. Imagine trying to run a company if your power constantly went in and out. At the very least, it could put a serious dent in productivity. Toby said that happens even in some of the region's major cities, including the capitals of Nigeria, Ghana, and Cote d'Ivoire, which all suffer from unreliable power grids. He also said that renewable power, like solar and wind, can alleviate those problems, often at surprisingly low cost. Most people still think that solar power is more expensive than gas or than coal plants, and the reality in a growing number of countries is that's no longer the case. Solar PV can actually be done more cheaply than any other generation option, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa where the solar resource is so strong. So it is increasingly the cheapest thing on the market. Solution Center experts like Toby bring with them a wealth of knowledge like this and a deep understanding of how and why energy policies succeed or fail. But when they step in to provide assistance, as Toby did with the action plans for the 15 ECOWAS nations in spring 2014, it's not to dictate a particular course of action, but to offer useful advice and flag potential missteps. This is exactly the kind of targeted support that I think a lot of governments really need. This isn't a question of giving them subsidies, you know, throwing money at the problem. This is really about trying to help them make better decisions, implement better laws, so that they can strengthen their own institutions. The approach seems to be working. In West Africa, several major clean energy projects are underway, including a 30-megawatt solar PV plant in Burkina Faso, an 80-megawatt wind farm in Senegal, and a concentrating solar thermal hybrid plant that could power Niger's capital, Niamey. Cape Verde, where Mahama lives, already gets nearly 30% of its electricity from wind and solar and has set a target of 50%. I think the support that the Clean Energy Solution Center gave was really enormous. They were one of the first who agreed to offer technical assistance, and that really gave impetus to others to also agree to come on board. Elsewhere around the world, the Solution Center's experts have responded to upwards of 250 requests in more than 90 countries, with more coming in all the time. And there's a good reason that so many governments are starting to look to them for clean energy help before they go anywhere else. The beauty is that we get them started. We get them unstuck. That's Vicki Healy. I work at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory as a project manager where I manage the Clean Energy Solution Center. Vicky is a dynamo. She's been with the Solution Center pretty much since the beginning. Oh, <laughs> I, I sort of fell into it. When I first started, we had no experts, so I built a team of experts. So it sounds like you're, you're very well connected. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's important. She isn't kidding. She's in constant contact with her squad of experts and checks in regularly with the many people around the globe who are receiving help from the Solution Center. In fact, our interview was interrupted by one such call. And one of those... Oh, still there? Hold on, sorry. Actually, that's Toby calling me. I'm trying to send ah. the voicemail. For Vicki, the Solution Center is all about providing that first line of support to governments that need it the most. She said they try to respond to any request that comes in within 48 hours. A lot of times these offices are staffed by one, maybe two people if you're lucky. If they're submitting a request, it means they need help now, and we're here to help now. We're the help desk, and we have excellent top-rate people yeah. standing by to deliver that assistance. This is something you hear over and over when you talk to people who work in and around the Clean Energy Solutions Center. Speed is paramount. Governments have many virtues, but speed and efficiency are not often among them. One of the things that the Solution Center tries to provide is an efficient, rapid turnaround service that keeps it light on paperwork so that we don't get bogged down in endless forms and approvals and, and overhead. So it's worth noting that the Clean Energy Solution Center is part of a larger effort to help drive a global clean energy revolution called the Clean Energy Ministerial, or SEM. The Solution Center is just one of a bunch of initiatives organized under the SEM umbrella that tackle everything from energy-efficient lighting to empowering women in the field of clean energy. Efforts like these are especially important in light of the Paris Climate Agreement reached last November, when every country agreed to take steps to reduce carbon emissions in an effort to slow the effects of climate change. For the Solution Center, that has meant even greater interest in clean energy policy assistance and greater urgency. We're getting a lot of requests from countries who are feeling they have that momentum now to take things forward. And so I feel really optimistic about not only the future of the Solution Center and being able to deliver even higher impact assistance, but also the world at large. For many nations, clean energy represents both a chance to improve the quality of life for their citizens and to reduce the impact of climate change. If we don't do anything, then we are bound to live with the challenges of climate change, global climate change, and also the localized climate change that we're creating. Mahama said that when his nation, Cape Verde, first began to embrace clean energy, the benefits were so clear that the government set a bold target. Generate 100% of the country's electricity from renewables by 2050. That's the kind of ambitious goal the Solution Center can help with. And it's an example of just how much enthusiasm there is for clean energy in the parts of the world that need it most. I mean, the excitement was really so high that they just wanted to go above the bar. So for today, to talk 100% renewables is a big challenge. But that is what they are dreaming of. Climate change is this big, scary, global problem. And it's easy to feel overwhelmed and hopeless in the face of it. But all around the world, people are working to tackle this challenge together. On a very human level, that's what the Clean Energy Solutions Center is all about. People helping one another solve problems. And for Bahama, Toby, Sean, and Vicky, and many, many more people around the world, the clean energy revolution starts with a phone call. Hey, this is producer Dan Wood. Coming up, Allison interviews energy rock star Nikki Fear, and I'm going to tell you how many burritos it would take to carve Mount Rushmore. Stay with us. Around the world, women play an important role in energy innovation, but sometimes that role goes unrecognized. The Clean Energy Education and Empowerment Initiative, otherwise known as C3E, was created to recognize women doing amazing work in clean energy fields and to encourage other women to get involved in clean energy research and development. Now in its fifth year, C3E's annual Women in Clean Energy Symposium was held on May 31st at Stanford University. Ahead of this year's symposium, I got a chance to talk with award recipient Nikki Fear about nature, climate change, and teaching on a bicycle. My name is Nikki Fear, and I'm a faculty member at the University of Montana, Missoula, and I run an undergraduate degree program focused on climate change that's interdisciplinary and has a solutions area where we get students involved in 
clean energy solutions, and other initiatives. So what was it that drew you to climate change? No, I was a real nature-based kid. My dad was really central. He was my primary caretaker. And I remember some of the central lessons for him were about being comfortable in nature. He helped me you know, be in the elements comfortably and freely. I remember him teaching me to walk in the darkness and over sharp rocks and get my feet tough. So that was really central to me is just being connected to the outdoors and to nature. And I think that piece, not necessarily from a science perspective, but more of a of an, a care and appreciation and general sense of wanting to understand human land connections, he started at a very young age. Uh, but my first job was actually leading people in the outdoors to Outward Bound in the mountains. So I was a leader of um, high school and college students on trips that lasted anywhere from three weeks to a month in the mountains of Colorado. That sounds incredible. So when you teach now, how often are you outside versus how often are you in a classroom? Well, I would say it's a mix. I teach one lecture class on campus. I teach an internship program where I get students involved with work with local organizations. I teach a course in Vietnam every other winter session for a month in the Mekong Delta looking at climate change impacts and adaptation. And then I have also developed several courses in Montana, one by bike across Montana, looking at um, energy production and climate change impacts of three weeks, 600 miles across Montana. And then also a field course that starts in Glacier National Park for a couple of weeks, and there's three different sites that we spend a few days, but we drive between those areas in Glacier and also the um, Swan Valley and the Blackfoot Valley, looking again at how climate change is impacting mountain ecosystems, forest and people in forest communities, and also ranchers and ranch lands. Wow. So for the biking course, are you teaching while you're on the bike? Yeah, it's actually a, a, an incredible venue for learning. We start in coal country and tour a coal fire power plant and oil refinery, bike up through um, the, the, the ranch lands, staying with ranchers, learning about, um, you know, kind of where the coal is, um, revenue opportunities, impacts, impacts from, from development, from changing um, weather patterns. We then bike through the center of Montana where you can see all forms of energy production, large-scale wind farms, um, community-scale individual wind turbines, solar, geothermal, biofuels. And so what's great about it is you learn about what motivates people to develop these different energy sources, how they benefit the communities, some of the challenges, and meet the people who are involved in making it happen. So it's actually a phenomenal learning environment to have a chance to sit down with people in their own place to learn about the issues. Um, and then on, bike, on the bike, you get a chance to internalize the learning, um, get some exercise, have some fun, take in the landscape as you travel from place to place. And then the third benefit is students are learning how to um, transport themselves with people power. So I always love asking women who work in science, technology, engineering, and math fields, or STEM, as we like to call it, what was it that kept you in the field? Yeah, well, I am not from the natural sciences. I'm from the social sciences, and it's been really interesting over the last few years to see my orientation move towards a focus on, on gender dynamics, and I wasn't expecting that. What I love about this C3E award is it not only recognizes women for their leadership in clean energy, but also for their um, education and empowerment of others. And it's been something that has been you know, one of the central pieces of my work is, is helping women to see their strength and find ways for them to connect around this, this climate change issue in ways that are resonant with their skills and passions. And being a mentor to young women has been the most rewarding part of my job. And then to get recognized for it at this level is, is kind of astounding. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming and congratulating Nikki Fear. 
Little did I know a year ago that there was this initiative, working to advance women and clean energy at the national and international level. And I couldn't be more thankful for being recognized for my work in education <clears throat> and empowerment. It's been a lifelong dedication of mine, so to be recognized in this way means a great deal to me. So I'm motivated to continue to grow our program and to help empower the next generation to be leaders in this clean energy movement. And I will say that this award has already helped me on that path. So thank you. In our first segment, Matt talked about the opening of a 30 megawatt solar plant in West Africa. But do you know what a megawatt is? What does that even mean? I know two guys who I think can help us understand energy and power with units that are a little bit easier to understand. What are up? Hey, this is Dan Wood, and I'm here with my colleague, Paul Lester. hey -o. And we're at our favorite local burrito joint to talk about energy and units of energy. Now, before your ears glaze over, and that's not a saying, but before your ears glaze over, we promise to make this interesting, or if not interesting, a little bit weird. And this involves burritos? Yes, but not just burritos. We got burritos, we got dynamite, we got Mount Rushmore coming up, New York City, and the moon landing. Okay, okay, you, you whetted my appetite. How do all these things fit together? So, if I told you you used a few hundred million BTUs, or British Thermal Units, of energy last year, would that mean anything to you? Uh, not a, nothing at all. Sounds like a lot, though. So, it is a lot, but the reality is that New York City, for instance, uses 18 million times that amount every year. That's 2.6 quadrillion BTUs of energy every year. It's kind of incomprehensible, right? Oh yeah, definitely. I don't have no comprehension of that. I mean, I know that you can count to a quadrillion just in your yeah. spare time, but yeah. a lot of us can't. I think we need new units of energy. There's so many that exist already, but none of them really are uh, very descriptive. They're all kind of esoteric. Calories, joules, British thermal units, therms, quads, kilowatt hours, and something called a foot pound, just to name a few. And all this time I thought a foot pound was something people just did at a Mumford & Sons concert when they were really feeling the funk, am I right? <laughs> I'm getting hangry, so you go on. I'm going to eat some chips right now. So let's make some new units of energy. Better ones, weirder ones, ones that you can really understand because they're from the real world. Let's start with burritos. Okay, so like burritos, like the burrito that I'm looking at right now that looks absolutely delicious and amazing? Yes. You know, burritos contain a lot of energy. This burrito in front of me has carne asada, rice, cheese, maybe some veggies, all these amazing proteins, carbs, and fats. They, they help you do work. You know, they help you to stay warm. They help you to pump blood, move your muscles. So this burrito in front of you, it has 1,200 kilocalories in it. You know, if you were to burn a 1,200 kilocalorie burrito, it would heat up 1,200 kilograms of water by one degree Celsius, which I think is pretty amazing. Oh yeah, definitely. That sounds pretty good. All right, so there you have our first new unit of energy, burritos. Instead of saying, I left my lights on all day and it used up 8,000 BTU, you can say, shoot, I left my lights on all day and it burned up two burritos worth of energy. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense, but... Are we actually going to eat this burrito or just talk about it? Yeah, I mean, you can eat it, but I'm, I'm going to keep talking. Okay, that sounds like a good deal to me. Okay, so here's something that's going to blow your mind. Are you ready? I was born ready. Okay, well, get this. Pound for pound, which do you think has more energy, dynamite or a burrito? Um, my gut tells me dynamite, but I have a feeling you're going to say burrito. That's right. It, it's a burrito. Very intuitive of you. So a burrito contains more pound for pound energy than a stick of dynamite. Wow. Me and this burrito... The one I'm eating right now? Yeah, the one that you're eating right now. What? How does that work? So here's how it works. Your gut is amazing. It is responsible for taking really good care of you. While dynamite releases energy like... Think about it. Burritos, they release energy over the course of hours and sometimes even days. Your gut does that for you. If your gut wasn't there, it would release energy like that at a drop of a hat and you would explode. So you got to handle that burrito with care because you never know when it's going to blow. And you got to say nice things about your gut. Well, thank you, Gut. So this brings us to our second unit, the Rushmore. As in Mount Rushmore? Right. Like the Presidents? Yes, the Presidents is in South Dakota. Our next unit is called the Rushmore because it approximates the amount of energy expended when Mount Rushmore was carved using dynamite. I had to do some rough estimates here, very rough, but I calculated that Mount Rushmore required about 56,000 sticks of dynamite to create. Now, when you compare, that's just over 7,000 burritos worth of energy. So Rushmore's are really big, but you know what they're a lot smaller than? Do you want me to guess? No, I'll just tell you. It's a lot smaller than what I like to call a New York Minute. Now, according to the National Academy of Sciences, New York uses more energy than any city on Earth. That's 2.8 times 10 to the 18th joules per year. 
that's not just electricity. That's fuel for cars, heating oil, and whatever the vendors use to heat up the hot dog carts. The finest hot dogs in New York City. It's an astronomical number, and if you divide that number by 365 days in a year, then by 24 hours in a day, and then by 60 minutes in an hour, you get an average energy consumption for a New York minute. So that's why it's called a New York minute. Does that make sense? Yeah. So guess what? It's 150 times bigger than a Rushmore. For every square mile in New York City, a half of a Rushmore is used every single minute of the day. So in a New York minute, everything can change? Bah! Yes. In a New York minute, everything can change. If you took 1,700 of your closest friends and gathered all the food you'd eat in a year, and then you burned it, it would power New York City for one minute. It's pretty insane. That's equivalent to 1.1 million burritos, and that's just for one minute of New York. Okay, so wait a minute. Let, let me make sure I got this right. We have 7,000 burritos in a Rushmore, and we've got 152 Rushmores in a New York minute. So what's next? Bum, bum, bum. A moon landing. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Wait a minute. Did we just put a rocket into this burrito place? Not just any rocket, my friend. A Saturn V rocket. The single largest engine that's ever been built. That's the kind we use to get to the moon. That's one small step for man. In three stages of liftoff, it used some 209,000 gallons of kerosene rocket fuel and 3.7 million gallons of liquid hydrogen. In total, it used enough energy to power New York City for 11 minutes. By comparison, that's about 1,700 Rushmores and 12.1 million burritos. Does that make sense? Mm. Get all those burrito sounds in there. Mm, He's really eating a burrito, you guys. Mm. Damn, I'm not sure if I buy all this. I know someone who might be able to convince you. Let's talk to an expert. Let me uh, finish putting this burrito in my pie hole. Let's go back to the office and call this guy. Sounds good. Hi, this is Jerry. Hey, Jerry. Uh, this is Dan, and I'm here with my colleague, Paul. And then I told him that you're my energy units guy. Yes, I'm your guy. Paul, I work for the National Institute of Standards and Technology. We're part of the Department of Commerce. And what NIST does, or NIST, is to maintain the national standards of electrical power and energy, uh, namely the watt and the watt hour. We don't use New York minutes or burritos or Mount Rushmore's <laughs> or anything like that, although it would be pretty cool. All of these units that you're proposing really depend upon how the energy is used, like to send a rocket to the moon or to uh, power a city. And, and that's how Many of these units began, you know, they began with an application and uh, typically on the end user uh, where the power is actually, where the electricity is actually used, um, that's measured in kilowatt hours. So from my calculations, a burrito is about equal to a, a kilowatt hour. Why not just use uh, burritos? So I guess um, not everyone is eating burritos or cooking burritos uh, with the electric power that they consume. Of the ones that I suggested, which do you think would have the most chance of becoming widely adopted, even if it's just in shorthand for comparing energy? Well, I, I kind of like the New York Minute, um, because that one, you know, there's, there's a lot of people living in New York, and they would like it too. If we were to use something like a, a New York Minute as a large unit of measure for energy, how would we go about like officially calibrating and, and measuring it? Typically, these are result of commercial products that come up with measuring uh, in a certain way and, and naming units like that. But they don't really deviate as much as the New York Minute might from the uh, conventional units, the standard international uh, system of units. So you're, you're saying that if, if there was a burrito measurement to measure energy, it would be you guys that would uh, have to standardize it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, standardization comes back around in a number of ways, but one of the things that we uh, like is promoting the use of a, uh, a certain group of units that are used universally. Uh, but yes, if a, if a burrito were proposed, then we would like to be able to measure it here at NIST. Well, Jerry, it's been great chatting with you. You've been very helpful in, uh, set to settle our bet. Well, thanks a lot, and uh, and. Good luck with it. <laughs> I hope you get these uh, these ideas of the New York Minute and the burrito uh, more widely socialized. I kind of <laughs> like them. Thanks, Jerry. Appreciate All right. It. All right, so there you have it, Paul. You believe now? 
I think it's all incredible, and I'm getting really hungry after learning all this stuff. So I'm going to go grab another burrito. Dan, why don't you tell them where you can learn more about this stuff? All right. Well, if you guys enjoyed learning about this stuff, head over to energy.gov slash burritos. We have a bunch of really cool data, the work cited, and an approximate methodology for you to work with so you can learn more about it. That's energy.gov slash burritos. That's it for this episode. As always, you can learn more about the topics we covered in the show on our website, energy.gov slash podcast. You can subscribe to Direct Current on iTunes and follow us on social media. You'll find us at Energy on Twitter and Instagram and on Facebook and YouTube at U.S. Department of Energy. We'd like to thank Nikki Fear, Vicki Healy, Mahama Kapia, Toby Couture, and Sean Esterly for helping us out with this episode. And don't forget Jerry Fitzpatrick, who helped us learn that the New York Minute really could be a good energy unit. Direct Current is produced by Matt Dozier, Simon Edelman, and me, Allison Lantero, with segment producer Daniel Wood. Art and design by Carly Wilkins, with support from Pat Adams, Paul Lester, Atik H, Ernie Ambrose, and our boss, Marissa Newhall. Thanks to John LaRue, the Energy Public Affairs team, and the DOE Media team. We are a production of the Department of Energy and published from our nation's capital in Washington, D.C. In case you missed it, check out the teaser we released last week that has a sneak preview of some of our upcoming episodes. Until next time, thanks for listening.